So the title that I gave this talk, From Emerald to Ireland, I think that the title when I spoke here, whatever, 19, 20 years ago, was From Emerald to Ireland. So as you can see, in the last 20 years, I've moved and beyond. Uh, uh, the subtitle there is Gavin Hughes's Journey. Life is a journey. It's a metaphor. It's likely as old and worn out as the first caveman who arrived back home with a club hanging over one shoulder and dinner over the other. But I wish to use the idea of the journey in three different ways here tonight. First, Captain Hughes' physical travels. Let me show you a photograph of Captain Hughes, first of all. Photograph from Northern Alberta in 1909. Captain Hughes' physical travels literally took her around the world, from our Irish Catholic community at County Line, now Emerald, on the border of Prince, who's Queen's County, Europe, and Central Ireland, across Canada, into the United States, across the Atlantic Ocean, Britain and Ireland, later on across the Pacific Ocean of North America to Australia and New Zealand, and then France and back to North America. We can list and chart Hughes's destinations from primary source documents such as letters, excuse me, such as letters, and from secondary sources such as newspapers accounts. Relatively speaking, that's the easy work describing and listing the places that she visited and where she traveled to. The second way of viewing the journey is somewhat more challenging. Yes, we have Hughes' starting off points. We have her destinations. In general, we know how she traveled. But what were her experiences? What happened in the course of the actual journeys? What did she see? With whom did she travel? Who did she encounter along the way? Did people she meet influence her and cause her to change her destination? And so why? Or at a junction along the road, the Jews remain focused on her original goal and committed to her path while one time companions headed off in another direction. In other words, the idea of journey of what actually kind of is happening along the way, what kind of decisions is she making as she travels along. The third and final take on the idea of a journey relates to the motivation behind it. Trying to understand what it is that drives someone to start on a specific journey. With Catherine Hughes, this has been and remains the most difficult part of my research. There is an unfortunate absence of material from Hughes herself explaining her view of the world, especially by a young, educated Prince Edward Island woman who was ambitious and successful and accomplished in her native country in the era before female, female suffrage, why she would embark on a journey that would transform her from a Canadian political insider to Irish political rebel and outcast. And as I say, trying to make sense of what's going on in Catherine Hughes' head is, has always been typical part of this work. I've been working on Catherine Hughes off and on for over 20 years now. I remain intrigued by a figure who achieved so much in a fairly short life. Born in 1876, she died in 1925, thus she was only 49 years of age at the time of her death. Educated at Notre Dame Convent here in Charlottetown, she then received her teacher's license at Prince of Wales College. Hughes taught at the Catholic Mohawk was there at St. Regis, now Akasasne, close to Cornwall, Ontario, for seven years. She started writing. Her first book was a biography of her uncle, P.E.I. born Catholic Archbishop of Halifax, Cornelius O'Brien. Hughes was one of the founding members of the Canadian Women's Press Club in 1915. She moved to Edmonton in 1906, where she became that province's first provincial archivist. She <coughs> was the private secretary to the first two premiers of Alberta. But she also found time to publish a biography of Alberta Con, the famous author of missionary in Western Canada, and to establish in Edmonton the Catholic Women's League, the 
first branch of what later became a national organization. After moving to London, England, as secretary of the office of the agent general of Alberta, Hughes met uh, Irish political and cultural activists there, including Patrick O'Connor, the most important Irish language writer in the first quarter of the 20th century, with whom Hughes wrote a play in English. Hughes's time in London transformed her life. She visited Ireland, became a supporter of Irish political independence from Britain, and despite her subsequent return to North America, set herself on a mission, and used that word purposely, to lobby for Irish independence. Hughes, using her skills from the spheres of politics and journalism, was a major player in North America in establishing the publicity slash propaganda arms of pro-Irish organizations in the United States, such as the Friends of Irish Freedom. She returned to Canada in 1920 to help set up the self-determination for Ireland League of Canada in Newfoundland. She visited Prince Edward Island as part of that work in July 1920. And subsequently, she set up a sister organization to the Self-Determination League in Australia and New Zealand in 1921. Hughes took the Republican anti-treaty side in the Irish Civil War. However, she was back living in New York from 1922 until 1925, and it was in New York City that she died of cancer in April 1925. Soon, for a host of reasons, Hughes was a forgotten figure, not just in her native Prince Edward Island, but also for former activists and historians who wrote about the Irish struggle for independence, and for researchers and scholars of women here in Canada. In other words, uh, soon after her death, Hughes becomes a forgotten figure, uh, and it's much later on when that work begins on essentially uh, reclaiming the discovery of the city. <coughs> what you have above are the bare bones of Hughes' life and story, the skeleton biography. As I said, this is the sort of story that still fascinates me after all these years. But I admit freely that Captain Hughes remains an enigma to me. I don't understand the woman. I don't know what made her think. I feel somewhat in awe, even intimidated by a person who seems to have been driven by a sense of faith and mission. In particular, I don't know why Katie Hughes of Emerald, as she was described at the time of her graduation from the Prince of Wales, why she would become so psychologically caught up with so intellectually engaged by, so emotionally attached to the cause of Ireland that she would sacrifice her career on its behalf. Of course, this is not just a gap in my understanding, but it reflects a gap in the sources, especially a clear explanation from Hughes as to her thinking uh, and help in making sense of apparent contradictions in her career. Yes, one can point her Irish Catholic background and extraction to help explain some of her motivation. Her father's people, the surname Hughes, being merely an anglicization of the Gaelic name E, are, uh, were part of South uh, uh, Ulster, Mama and Irish, in South Ireland. While her mother's side, the O'Briens, were from Munster, in the far south of Ireland. But focusing on Hughes's background only takes us a short distance. His new name, many, new name, any of our individuals from the Irish community here at Prince Edward Island who displayed similar levels of engagement with and activism on behalf of their ancestral homeland, shown by Hughes. So in other words, focusing on her background takes us a certain distance in understanding what's motivating this character, but it doesn't explain everything. Uh, there are other factors clearly at play there that won't make sense of. In my early period working on Hughes, I had plans to write a full biography, uh, and to that end, I drafted a manuscript. It's frequently said that biographies dealing with male characters are different from biographies dealing with female characters. Paula Backscheider writes in her book, Reflections on Biography, 
that biographies of men are dominated by external events, most biographies of women are a blend of external and internal. In other words, not just what they did, but what's motivating what's going on in their head. But the focus of male characters tend to be on what, what they did. Ironically, the situation I was facing with my draft biography of Jews was that I had loads of material for an external biography, all the action, what she did, where she went, etc., but little material makes sense of her internal life, i.e., why she did what she did. I was left to resort to speculation, and this at that time seemed to me to, to negate the idea of what a biography should be, a full, accurate, and insightful presentation of a life. Editors and others who read my draft biography of Jews recognized both the potential and the work but also the weaknesses. A lack of context in places, but especially the imbalance between the account of external events and the exploration of Jews' character and personality. I abandoned my Jews biography and published a few articles in Irish and English in Ireland and Canada on aspects of her career. Meanwhile, I turned to another project, and I'm going to sort of take what seems to may seem a little bit of a digression, but I would actually argue it's simple to, to uh, make sense of how to, to deal with the use of life. Meanwhile, I turned to another project, in fact, a full-length critical biography of Pierce Paisley, an Irish language writer, a figure, figure similar to Hughes, a member of the Irish diaspora. In fact, I spoke about this character based the year a number of years ago. This was a big project that was involved during much of the 90s and until a few years ago. Hughes is, uh, uh, basically as I say, was kind of similar to Hughes, a member of the Irish diaspora who gets involved in Irish politics. And basically was born and raised in Liverpool, England, before moving to Dublin at the age of 24. Basically made a significant contribution to the cause of Irish independence. He was a founder of the Irish Volunteers in 1913. He participated in the Easter Rising in 1916. He was a member of the first Doyle Erin and the Successionist Parliament established in Dublin in 1919. He was jailed, he escaped from prison twice. Later on, he wrote the first biography of his comrade friend, Michael Collins. As such, we're dealing, in the case of Basie, with another figure who lived through exciting times and made his own contribution. The difference between Basley and Captain Hughes as subjects of biography was that the former frequently had three or four joke diaries going at the one time, where he talked about absolutely everything, and I mean absolutely everything, including his view of the world, whereas Hughes left nothing. The contrast couldn't be more different basically left me so much, too much, I would argue, to work with and explore in the inner life, Hughes left next to nothing. However, there's more than better in the context of biographers coming to grip with the life. In the course of my work with Basie, I became interested in the art form that is life writing, i.e. biography, autobiography, memoirs, diary writing, letters, things like that there and critical discussions about life writing as a form of literature. In the entry for biography in the Oxford Companion to English Literature, it stated, contemporary biographers are self-conscious about their art, questioning the boundaries between fact and fiction, grappling with gaps in knowledge or different versions of events, and acknowledging that while they can offer a life of their subject, they cannot offer the life. And they have things like theoretical and discursive work on biography and artistic form try to deal with a number of recurrent issues, the ethics of invading privacy, the ambiguity of the links between art and life, the questionable objectivity of such sources as letters and diaries, in other words, when somebody writes out a diary, are they really writing it for themselves? Or are they conscious of the fact that someone may read it down the line? And that affects 
how they, what they actually present. But the brand is sick with diary writers. Okay. Until the question of questions that I'm reading, but in the actual, in the automatic they accept that the diary is a, an accurate account of what the company is feeling, so we have what all the factors are in there. In other words, in the case of paper, I see four diaries. All the agendas here. The directions involved in plotting a life, <coughs> the role of empathy and psychological interference <coughs> between author and subject. These are the sorts of issues that start cropping up in Ken when you start getting into the critical discussions of writing a life. I can actually add to the list of all from my own experience the things an author chooses subjectively to leave in or to leave out of a biography. Or instead of feeling empathy for a character, what about when you start to hate Pinker for whom you're writing? For example, my character, Pierce Paisley, uh, lived until the age of 84 in 1965. He did absolutely nothing in the last 40 years of his life but talk about his earlier exploits. Many a time, I wished as a biographer that the British had executed them in 1916. <laughs> <laughs> but in my life, as a biographer, an awful lot easier. In other words, these are the sorts of personal things that, that, that inevitably get in the, that come into the discussion of, of, of when one's working on a biographer. As a biographer, one attempts to check and double check facts and figures. But you quickly realize that there is no firm divide between biography and creative writing, i.e. fiction. Yes, when I worked on my Basley book, I had access to diaries and letters that I used, uh, that, um, that I used fully to produce my literary portrait of Basley. However, another biographer using the exact same sources would produce a different portrait just as a third person who used those sources plus, say, a few documents that I had missed in my research would produce a different portrait again. All biography is ultimately fiction, wrote Eric Mallow, the American novelist, the short story writer. I agree. It's <coughs> like saying in Irish, the God ancient, the scale of this God ancient Jacob Ireland. There's two versions of the story, 12 versions of the song. I'd add that there's a limit, limitless number of uh, the versions of a life, and there's no such thing as a definitive biography. This focus on Basley, on uh, that biography, may appear to be a digression, as I say, to my discussion of Catherine Hughes. I'd also argue that it is central to that discussion. For to return to this idea of a journey, I, a want to be, but frustrated biographer of Hughes, who had cast aside my draft biography due to a lack, an absence of, uh, of, of sort of internal material, had to embark on a journey of my own. Specifically, I had to come to an understanding of biography as an art form. A biography, no matter how complete or comprehensive it seems to be, is merely a version of a life. A subject, a construct that has a large creative and imaginative component to it, similar to fiction. Once we accept that biography is one person's take on another life, and that a biography is no closer to the actual life than, say, the portrait of Mona Lisa is to a real person, that one doesn't have to be able to document everything, that one is free to draw on the insights come through imaginative recreation and speculation. And one believes that these things help to understand and get into and get insight into another's life. Uh, that one really can use all the skills and all the all the all the tools associated with fiction uh, when one is working on a biography. It was only once I got my head around these issues and come to a fresh understanding of the potential of this in biography, that I realized that despite the absence of letters and diaries, that I actually could set about finishing off 
my biography of Catherine Hughes. I am now, after many years, back working with Catherine Hughes and plan to finish off my reworking of my manuscript in the months ahead. Rather than going back over in more detail the, the summary that I gave at the start of this talk, I want to look at a handful of the journeys taken by Hughes, the pause and stops along the way to outline the facts, the gaps, the issues, and possible readings of these situations. And the first journey involving Catherine Hughes is one from June 1904. And as you see there, uh, it's from the female journalist on Tripps and Lewis, 1904. Catherine Hughes is there on the far left. And I don't know if you read the piece of the book, but this journey, this trip with the female writers established the Canadian Women's Press Club. It's one of these uh, uh, formative events in Catherine Hughes' early career, but also formative events in the history of, uh, of the women's movement. It's June 1904, and Catherine Hughes, for that a journalist based in Ottawa, but who's been writing for the Montreal Star and other newspapers, she is invited to join a group of 16 female journalists who are to attend the St. Louis World Fair and to visit Chicago on a trip sponsored by the Canadian Pacific Railway, which provided free transport and accommodation. This trip is an unusual event. Women are still making their way and finding their feet in the male-dominated world of journalism. With the odd exception of that, female journalists have been limited to writing about women's issues, the home and children, rather than the full range of human activities, including politics, war, industry, etc. Women have not had the opportunity previously to cover events such as Fair. In the course of their trip, these women journalists, including Catherine Hughes, talk about their experiences in their chosen field, share stories, and decide to form an organization which will be open to publish for the writers. That is the Canadian Women's Press Club. Catherine Hughes would remain active in the Canadian Women's Press Club during the rest of her time in Canada. As an organization, it would grow and attract other group of women journalists and writers not from that 1904 trip. In, in particular interest here is the way in which quite a number of Canadian women press, uh, press club members, figures such as Nellie McClung and Emily Murphy, who worked in the Canadian Canadian Women's Press Club in Edmonton and Captain Hughes, moved into a more overtly political sphere social reform, including the big issue of the day, the campaign for female suffrage, i.e. the vote for women. So in other words, for a lot of these women figures at the time, uh, the, C the CWPC is part of their uh, entry into sort of uh, this idea of women working together, and a lot of them then move on to social reform, including the campaign for the vote for women. Hughes shared a lot in common with her fellow Canadian Women Press Club members, for example, seeking improved opportunities for women, better employment conditions. But she opposed the vote for women. I think about this figure of Catherine Hughes, everything that she managed to accomplish. She opposed the vote for women. In a biographical sketch of Catherine Hughes in 1913, the journal Saturday Night reported Though she has been thrown into man's realm by reason of her political and literary work, Miss Hughes does not believe women should enjoy suffrage. She is prepared to take a stand in favor of the existing franchise so far as its discrimination between the sexes is concerned. She will be a home ruler in the hull of the militant suffragist movement. At the time of that interview, Hughes was private secretary to Arthur Sifton, the premier of Alberta. She was up to her neck in politics. She was a trusted advisor to the premier. 
She had power and influence in the background. She owns women out of the boat. Heighten the extent of that. There, is, there appears to be a fundamental contradiction here that Hughes never explains. In the absence of an explanation of Hughes, this is where one has to start speculating. This is where the lines between a narrow definition of biography and a kind of life based solely on certifiable fact starts to merge with, I suppose, fiction. Now, one could argue that Catherine Hughes was no feminist. The quote above would support that. But when you look at Catherine Hughes' life, the ways in which she moved into positions of influence, this suggests someone who didn't believe that her gender should restrict her upward movement and her grasp, if indirectly, on power. It would be easy to present the case that Catherine Hughes was a role model for what the educated, modern, early 20th century woman could aspire to. One could argue she was conservative by nature, possibly. The main element that provides a clue as to why Hughes opposed female suffrage, I speculate, is her Catholicism. For when one looks at female activism in Canada that night, in other words, the bigger picture, two things emerge. One, female activists who move from the Canadian Women's Press Club to social reform, including female suffrage, were overwhelmingly, if not exclusively, Protestant. Second, there is evidence that Catholic women chose to direct their energy and activism into church-related organizations. Hughes was exceptionally active. Her second biography was of the pair of their Lacombe, the famous <coughs> old age missionary in Western Canada. Uh, so again, look at the role model that she's choosing for, the, for her biography. She was the founder, say, of the Catholic Women's League in, in, in Edmonton. She was the walking, talking embodiment of the church militant. Or so I would say that that's speculation on my part. That's where it seems to, to lead. Let's take the speculation one step further. The first president of the Daily Women's Press Club was the Irish board, Kit Coleman, of the Toronto Nail and Empire. Coleman, the best-known female and newspaper woman, or the best-known newspaper woman of her day, uh, she was the best-known new, uh, newspaper woman of her day. Like Hughes, Coleman was raised a Catholic, though she seems to have rejected the church fairly early on. Like Hughes, she was not a supporter of extending the vote to women, certainly not until quite later on. Barbara Freeman in her book, Kids Kingdom, the journalism of Catherine Blake Coleman writes, this is a quote, eventually she, Kate Coleman, openly supported female suffrage, but not before it became a respected cause celebre. This was rather late in the day for some of her contemporaries and for modern scholars who have found her lack of commitment to the women's movement hard to forgive. Note what can be said there. Thus, Catherine Hughes was not alone amongst the Canadian Women Press Club figures in her stand. But once she took a different route from women activists who moved into social reform, but they were going on different journeys, including once she moved, she, she went a different route, especially in the question of female, female suffrage, could one not argue that Hughes starts the process or why she's missed? neglected, possibly even ignored, by chroniclers and scholars of women in modern Canada, many of them, to borrow Freeman's line, would have found her lack of commitment to the women's movement hard to give. Again, <coughs> But inside, I should add that Hughes has been missed by those writing by Prince Edward Island women. The Santa Club of Charlottetown has now published three volumes. Century of Women, like 1967, Outstanding Women of Prince Edward Island, 1981, and most recently, Making History of Celebration of Prince Edward Island Women of the 20th Century. There's no mention of Catherine Hughes in any of those three books. Another journey, journey number two. 
It's late summer 1913, and Captain Hughes is preparing to leave Edmonton on a journey by train and by sea to London, England, where she will take on the newly established position as Secretary to the Agent General of Port Alberta, an office which seeks to provide support for those doing business with Alberta and those seeking to emigrate there. Of course, Alberta has become a problem in 1995. Things are starting to open up there. By 1913, when she leaves Alberta, Hughes has spent seven years in that city. These were seven busy and active and productive years. At first, she was a journalist there with the Edmund Bulletin. As I say, she then became the first provincial archivist. She is the first provincial archivist of the province of Alberta. She was private secretary to Premier Rutherford, the first Premier of Alberta, and to his successor, Arthur Sidgham. Beyond her day job, Hughes had also achieved a lot. Her biography of Albert Lacan, which had come out in 1911, had been well received. The following year, she had established the Italian Women's League of Edmonton, the founding branch of an organization which only became a national body in 1920. And Catherine City, her Catherine's sister, Loretta Hughes, uh, was the first national organizer. We don't know that Catherine Hughes left. Was she seeking a new challenge? Was it a case of wanderlust? Either of those might be correct, but here we go speculating again. The decision to leave Edmonton may have been influenced by her satisfaction with her private life. Hughes was now uh, in her mid 30s and unmarried. At that time, she was friendly with Paul A. Van Over. This is Van Over. She was friendly with Paul A. Van Hoover, a civil engineer in the Edmonton City Engineering Department. Unfortunately, the only correspondence between the two that survived several letters from Van Hoover to Captain Hughes. These letters, because they, they are personal letters, they're, they're, they're some of the very few uh, personal correspondence on which I have to uh, I can draw. But these correspondence uh, gives a rare and fascinating glimpse of the private Captain Hughes behind the public persona, Miss Hughes. In her and Don Ober emerges as an educated, intelligent, humorous man who is very much Captain's intellectual equal. His letters, while containing a formal opening, my dear Miss Hughes, he writes, they're frank and enlightening. This is one letter from October 1912, it's a quote. Whenever I meet you, I receive a note from you next day, which thoroughly reviews the conversation of the day previous, enlarges upon it, qualifies some of your sayings, and mostly manages to subtly credit me with some remark I didn't make. These things recall to my mind the remark I once made about your conversation being like a, 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 a radio fencing, ever changing from attack to defense, to fade back to attack, therefore always interesting, exhilarating, and amusing, because appealing to the instinct which the old Greeks called agony in the context of verbal dispute. Interestingly, in this letter, von Ofer advised Catherine to take advantage of a political possible job offer in London, England. This is what he writes. I take the job as a political one, or connected with politics, and politics being mostly a matter of will, are a congenial field for your imperious, persisting nature. There will certainly be no lack of congenial companionship in London. And this letter closes with Von Aper uh, anticipating, if not inviting, another bout another of the rapiers tomorrow. Now a second letter from May 1913, even more revealing, part of the States, it strikes me that when I'm in your presence, you cannot say what you want. And when I'm away, you dare not write what you want to say when I'm there. And I refuse to guess or divine anything. Only one thing you got clear now, that I do not contemplate marriage definitely. I certainly don't for reasons stated often at length. Have nobody in view either who's likely to change the reasons. It would be perhaps a kindness to you 
by relying to you about it and think of some affair which had the effect of settling you in Vancouver. You would forget in three months to chase after Will of the Wits, which here you might still be chasing three years hence. However, I'll not do it. I think you have a chance to get some common sense yet. Later on in this letter, Von Goldberg attacked Hughes's rigid views on mixed marriages. They also described her as a social climber. This is the last big quote. You certainly are a snob. After I knew you two months, you told me that the only two occupations worthwhile, in your opinion, were politician or literary man. These were the polite occupations. Then at races at the exhibition, we saw and laughed at a stupid-looking, healthy, well-dressed man. But after a while, you found out that he was a young Scotchman who had a ranch near Camrose, had an excellent establishment, his relatives were very wealthy, etc. And one got by requesting me to come acquainted with the man with the idea of visiting them. And when I pointed out that I had a ranch, relatives, or anything to make a social defense, you said, but you might be invited on account of your personality. Then I gave up arguing. The respective st st standpoints were too different to make life properly. As I say, these are the only kind of really sort of personal letters that crop up in the Hughes uh, papers. Catherine emerges from this admittedly one-sided correspondence with a strong, well-posted individual. Certainly, these are characteristics uh, uh, that she demonstrated throughout her relatively short life. In addition, she's seen as an inveterate social climber, as a lady full of airs and graces. This conflicts somewhat with the selfless and unsteady spending worker for Catholic causes. This merely points to one of the contradictions in her complex personality. Hughes liked to see herself as a woman of substance. In describing her as, in the quote, is royal woman, her fellow writer and journalist, Kate Simpson Hayes, succinctly summed up how Miss Catherine Angeline Hughes saw herself and how she liked always to see her. But what about her relationship with Von Hofer? What do we take from these letters? We see what on Oprah writes. We don't always have the context for those comments. Can we accept as fact the statement that he's no intention, intention of marrying? Or the suggestion that she is more interested in him than he and her? Are there things being said between the lines? Could it be a case that he's merely trying to protect himself because he knows that she won't marry him? And they accuse they never have been interested in marriage and children. The potential for speculation is endless. Let me provide a little bit more information on what Von Oprah. This is material which I came across quite recently. One of the great changes between the time when I started working on Hughes and these days now is uh, uh, so it's supposed to be summed up by one word Google. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't believe the amount of stuff that is actually available out there now. This is stuff I wouldn't have had years ago if I had sat Von Oprah. He was German born. Born in Germany, the exact location of the moment. He turns up in a Pennsylvanian census return before he moved to Edmonton. He was also a non Catholic, he was a Lutheran. In 1903, Catherine's sister Loretta, a strong and accomplished woman in her own right, had married Robert Neal from the Boston States, St. Catholic's, uh, St. Catholic's Catholic Church in Ottawa. He was a Methodist. <coughs> And the couple had received a dispensation from the bishop. Catherine Hughes had stood with her sister as one of the witnesses. That was 1903. By the time Von Ober and Catherine Hughes became friends, the correspondence I, I, that I mentioned there in 1912, the Catholic Church had recently controversially reformed its policy about marriage between Catholics and non Catholics. May Emery, the 1900 May issued during the papacy of Pius X, specifically declared that in the event of marriage between a Catholic and non-Catholic, children of that union should be baptized, educated, and raised as Catholics. While von Oberg, in one of his letters, attacked Hughes' attitude towards mixed marriage without actually telling us what they were, we can only presume that Hughes, the Catholic activist, was supporting the churches made Henry III. Add to, his, to this the fact that the Edmonton Catholic Women's League, from 
mission included helping new Catholic immigrants in a practical sense, but also seeking to ensure that these immigrants, including a sizable Ukrainian Catholic Orthodox community, didn't succumb to all sorts of temptations such as socialism, communism, and Protestantism. One can speculate that if Catherine Hughes, whatever her feelings about John Holder, would have felt that she, a member of the church militant, would be setting a bad example for the flock if she married a Protestant, even one who would convert to Catholicism. Knowing that she couldn't, wouldn't marry a John Holder, was the case that Hughes felt compelled to get away from everything. Similar to Hughes, John Holder never married. He died in Edmonton in the 1950s. Again, as you see, there's a certain amount of speculation what I'm suggesting there, but it's trying to sort of fill out some of the gaps where it might have search for the finished before with lack of resources, trying to look at the broader context. I should have noticed on the two examples above, Hughes' view of female suffrage and her relationship with John Walker, I'm suggesting that Hughes' strong Catholicism was the deciding factor in the choices that she made. She never stated that, of course, I need to expect it. Next journey. It's August 1914. The First World War has just started. Captain Hughes, now based in the Agent General of a British office in London, writes to uh, Albert Lacan back in Canada with one of her recent official tasks. Before this terrible war had altogether fallen, I came home from a pleasant trip in Ireland. The Irish people at home are not as rich as they are in Canada, but they are finer in many ways. Such fine courtesy of manner, warm hearts, and unselfish ways. At Dublin, I had lunch and tea with Lady Aberdeen, His Excellency, Lord Aberdeen, who of course was the, uh, the British Lord of Canada in Ireland, the former Governor General of Canada. Still the company that she was in, by the way. But, uh, I sat beside the ladder, I mean, for everything, and we had such a pleasant talk about you. They spoke of you with so much love. I gave them again the friendly messages you told them for me. Uh, as I say, note the circles that Hughes was in, but even as she met these notables in Dublin, Hughes was absorbing much more than the pleasant talk with the Lord Alfred. A number of years later, after her conversion to the cause of Irish independence was reported, and this is a quote, Miss Hughes went over to Ireland as an opponent to Sinn Féinism, i.e. the popular term for the Irish uh, independence movement. But she now claims that since her visit there, she has entirely changed her opinion. That's the end of the quote. In 1914, before her visit to Ireland, Hughes described herself as a home ruler, a supporter of limited self-government for Ireland within the British Empire. Subsequent to her visit, she became a strong supporter of fully independent Ireland. And she explained this dramatic shift. I want to tell you why I changed from a Canadian imperialist to Irish, a proper Irish person. No matter how much you know of the old history of Ireland, we know nothing of the conditions in Ireland until we go there by ourselves. And when I was sent over there in a position for our government some years ago and saw things for myself, I was appalled at the conditions. A country made up of the very old and the very young. She goes on, there were very few young adults. The rest had emigrated with many young males having enlisted in the British Army due to lack of opportunities at home. Hughes referred back to this transformation and her attitude on another occasion. This is what she said. The very thing which started me out in this Irish independence cause was the sight of those desolate, hearty, weary, hearted, a desolate, hearted, weary old Irish mothers, frequently without a child around them, all being overseas. Another account describes her making a comprehensive study of conditions in Ireland, having formed the acquaintance many of the outstanding figures in Irish history today. And she writes, 
I studied Irish and Ireland and Irish traditions as closely as I have been given an important journalistic assignment to cover the whole question. And since the war, the First World War, I decided to deal with the theme. I'm interested more than ever in it from a Canadian point of view. And these ideals that you refer to the right are self-determination and political independence. And she says, our boys, preferably Canadian soldiers, risk their lives for human liberty, for the right of small nations to live their lives without hindrance or coercion from their stronger neighbors. These are fine doctrines they are worth dying for. They are certainly worth living for and are simply trying to live up to them. That's as much of an explanation when we get from Catholic Jews of why she becomes an Irish Republican. I don't know how sort of how how comprehensive, uh, how insightful it is. That's what we have. Does it explain not just the transformation in her um, her attitudes, probably, but what it doesn't explain is that the decision to become an active an, an activist in the cause of Irish independence, to move from not just sharing uh, sort of various views with Irish nationalists, but from actually becoming a member of the movement that is going to push for Irish uh, independence and to essentially to direct her career in that direction. These explanations of the outcome of her business trip to, to Ireland do not give a complete story, however. Catherine had come into contact with a large expatriate Irish community in London, most likely before her momentous trip during the summer of 1914. In the pre-World War I period, this community included quite a number of Irish speakers and Irish language activists, members of the Gaelic League, the primary organization for the preservation and promotion of that threatened language. By 1914, the Gaelic League was becoming increasingly politicized following the year of the of a very political stand Irish national independence. But there is a play turns up in New York, uh, sorry, not New York, in Washington, D.C., with both their names on it. We don't know the exact situation. Was it from a synopsis that Hughes had that she and O'Connor then worked on it? How often did they meet? Uh, what role did O'Connor have in it? Did he involve the we just don't know. We're left guessing. We're trying to make sense what's there. All we know is that the play, the play exists. Uh, and um, I have to come across that Whatever the basis of their relationship, Hughes, after her time in London, this Ireland, was now embarked on a new journey that would dominate the rest of her life as a same. Another journey. It's May 1920. Catherine Hughes traveled from Washington, D.C. to Montreal. She was preparing to take on a new position as provisional organizing secretary for a yet unnamed nationwide pro Irish independence network. This would be self determination for Ireland, Canada, and Denmark. Hughes had just spent the previous two years, in other words, from 1918 through 1920 working as a full-time organizer for the Irish, pro-Irish independence movement in the United States. These two years have been exceptionally busy. Hughes had originally set up and staffed the Irish National Bureau, carrying the publicity and propaganda office. It was to let that uh, finance for the Irish Progressive League. Then when the Irish Progressive League and this bureau was done the way that threats of Irish people, the big old umbrella organization of the Irish movement in the United States, Hughes became a secretary to the publicity and lecture material, especially along the East Coast, the start of the East of the United States. So these have been massively sort of uh, busy years. Again, this was her commitment once she returned to North America, that she was going to dedicate herself to the Irish and She has been a full-time activist uh, of, uh, in the previous two years. But now, in 1920, she turns up in Canada. In many ways, Hughes was the perfect person to send to Canada in 1920 to establish a sister network there. She was a Canadian citizen. She couldn't be dismissed as an interfering American. She knew the place. She had lots of contacts. She was aware of the different, different circumstances between the United States and Canada.
that and even compare, for example, a name such as the organization of the United States, the Friends of Irish Freedom. Very, very sort of, uh, very certain about what I was aiming for. Look at the organization in Canada, the self-determination for Ireland. Reflect the different circumstances. You have to be more careful in Canada, part of the British Empire. Uh, there's strong evidence that Eamon de Valera, the president of the unilaterally declared Irish Republic within the United States in 1920, had personally selected Hughes to undertake this mission in Canada. And sure enough, Hughes, through her time and energy into setting up the self-determination league in Canada, she traveled across Canada and into the Dominion of Newfoundland during the summer of 1920, learned facts about Ireland too. She lectured here in Charlottetown, Charlottetown, excuse me, in July of the 8th. Apparently, it said the newspaper that broke the people in Edmonton Hall, attached to the city of Edmonton. And it's report of her lecture. This is taken from the Christopher said that I will take it. Uh, the, the, the title is called Eloquent Appeal by Miss Hughes for Self Generation for Ireland. Uh, it will come that the Miss Hughes has thrown her heart and soul into the work as evident from the presentation of Ireland's case. She is a speaker of unusual eloquence and power, and for over an hour and a half, despite the sultry atmosphere, she held the public attention of her audience, who time and again indicated their appreciation by hearty applause. In the course of that summer, Hughes didn't always get as positive a response. She was tailed by the RCFP and their agents, verbally attacked by Orangemen and their supporters. By the time the League had its first national convention in Ottawa in mid October 1920, with a membership of about 25,000, Hughes was introduced in this quote as the woman who has done more than any other for the cause of Ireland and Canada. Subsequently, at Eamon de Valera's request, she headed off on a mission to Australia and New Zealand to set up uh, their Irish self determination fleet. Right, without a doubt, it's easy, fairly accurate to state that this is that Catherine Hughes was the right person with the right set of credentials and skills to come to Canada in May 1920 to set up the self determination fleet. But there is another reading which suggests that there were those in the United States and the Irish people there who were happy to get rid of her, to send her back to Canada. When the Friends of Irish Freedom took over the running and financing of Hughes Irish National Bureau, based on a blueprint that she herself had developed, she clearly hoped that she would be appointed as director of the Irish National Bureau. Instead, that position went to Daniel Pete O'Connell, Boston lawyer. Hughes and O'Connell didn't get on. She wrote later on, I believe that he, I e. O'Connell, gets along well with many men, <coughs> but women have no reason for existence for them except as wives, mothers, school teachers, and very docile stenographers. <coughs> this raises question issues in gender. While Hughes seems to have had a good rate for working relationships various men and powers, think of the Alberta figures, or for example, Alberta Macomb. Her comments hint, though, that O'Connell may have felt threatened by an educated and experienced professional woman such as Hughes. In turn, Hughes felt that some men were not willing to treat her as their intellectual equal. This raises questions about the role of women in the Irish independence struggle and their struggle, uh, their struggle for equality. Interesting story in its own right. So, in that sense, what you kind of uh, uh, I get a sense is that, that O'Connell would be quite happy to see her go get her out of the way. She's trouble. We have hints that so O'Connell and Hughes' working relationship broke down. He tried to get her further and further removed from center of power in the Bureau, and in turn, he suited her to be away from the Bureau. That, to some extent, might explain her willingness to return. But there is one other element. If O'Connell likely sighed with relief when Hughes headed to Canada, it's equally likely, likely that the girls in the Titan pool, stenographers she referred to, also sighed with relief. Miss Catherine Hughes viewed herself as being a completely different league and class from the Titus, etc. And 
wasn't low to let them know that and put them in their place. Harry Bowles, the Irish Republican organizer who was based in New York, writes in his diary in April 1920, 6th April, Tuesday, Washington, I am at office all day, invite Miss O'Connell and Miss Rosser. Miss Hughes objects to staff being invited. Girls out for Miss Hughes blow. Bowles retires and leaves a fight between them. Captain Hughes was a top It's now August 1924. Here, by the way, I want to call the photographs. The later photograph of Hughes, undated, as well known photograph of her. It's now August 1924. The Irish campaign for political independence has resulted in limited success and loads of bitterness. After the Irish War of Independence came the truce in 1921, the treaty, the establishment of the Irish Free State. The British have left 26 of the 32 countries of Ireland. The other six, Northern Ireland, remain part of the United Kingdom. Irish independence activists are split between those supporting the Irish Free State and those against holding out for the United Irish Republic. The Irish Civil War between these former comrades short, nasty, and bloody. The pro-Irish networks in Canada and the United States, as many have collapsed, as many supporters believe that there's no form of Irish independence. Others are shocked by the way in which former colleagues turn their guns on each other. Catherine Hughes, now living in New York, remains a committed Irish Republican, but she's also pushing for Irish activists to uh, come together to that end, she established a new organization called the Irish Athena, Athena, the Wild Geese. I get back to the idea of the diaspora. And this, she tries to use this organization to try and unite the Irish. In turn, this alienates her Irish Republican associates who oppose any weakening of the principle and the cause of the Irish Republic. Also, during this time, she's trying to collect money from wealthy Irish Americans to set up her old friend, the Irish language writer, Roger O'Connor, as a writer in residence in the American College Bowl. She fails in this again, reflects the change in environment for things Irish in the United States after the Civil War. The New York based Irish priest and anti treaty activist Peter McGuinness recounted in detail the last occasion in which he met Hughes in August 1924. He wrote, She had just returned. Battle Creek, where she had been undergoing some cure in which she thoroughly believed. Like all who were rushing quietly to the gate of eternity, she was persuaded and wished to persuade others of her much improved condition of health. She was no longer <coughs> captain used of the days gone by. Her sparseness, her sparseness of body had hitherto given her a genteel appearance. Nowadays, one tremble, less than a frail body, might at any moment look and fail. The, uh, fall, excuse me. the face so sweet and so expressive of thought and culture was now drawn and somewhat haggard, and the telltale wrinkles were beginning to peep forth boldly. The hair that once weighed in steel gray tresses across her broad and expressive brow was thrown back and had become the color sad, pale face, wisely arranged in me, but there was no contrast in their colors. A voice was holding out well, save for a little tired drawl at the end of the sentences, and the wear of the end. This piece is fascinating for two major reasons. It's the only detailed account that we have of Hughes in the last year of her life. It's a cancer that will kill her the following year in its cold also the only reference that I have to use to this name Battle Creek. In fact, when I came across this reference to Battle Creek, I didn't know where the place was. This is back in Michigan, and has got two claims to pay. Battle Creek is the center of the Kellogg's Cornflake Empire. I do. Kellogg's Cornflakes. You know that cereal with more nutrition in the packaging than in the actual <laughs> <laughs> It's also, this is the word, it's also the home of the home of 
Battle Creek Stamp area, which offered a range of health treatments, including drying out and cleaning out facilities for the well. Uh, well, big what this one relates to use, but also pioneered experimental treatments for cancer. I say it's the only reference that, that I have, just that passing reference, we use and compare. We know absolutely nothing. One's left to speculate that so much. What shape was she in when she was tested? What treatment did she undergo? Did it help you or harm her? And the condition? How did she finance that trip? Did she use up all her savings? How did she cope with the emotions? Hopes of a successful treatment? Fears of failure? Where is her strong faith, faith in the picture? And was that enough? Captain Hughes was buried in an unmarked grave in St. Edmund's in the Bronx. Two of her sisters, with whom she lived in New York City, soon moved back to Canada. In the early 1950s, her sole surviving sister, Cornelia Hughes, wrote to the then Prime Minister of Ireland, in the Red Era, looking for help in drafting an inscription in Irish on stone that she hoped to direct at the graveyard. Never, not, never came. So apart from her family, Kathy Hughes was soon forgotten by most people. But really, I was talk I've been talking about journeys the whole way through, but there is one more journey, and really it's less to do with Kathy Hughes than to do with, uh, with us. In the years after I first published articles by Hughes in the early 1990s, I was disappointed with what I felt was a lukewarm response to the material amongst academics. This really was less a comment on Hughes and my work, than merely a reflection of the way in which it takes quite a while for new material to work its way through scholarly and academic systems. But I must say, in the last six, seven years, barely a year goes by now that we hear from people who are interested in Hughes, who are doing work which they've come across reference to Catholic Hughes. For example, 
just one or two little examples. This book was published uh, probably four or five years ago. It's an account in, in the promised land of Alberta's North, the northern journey of Catherine Hughes. Like it's actually a, an account, by Catherine, her diary of an account of a trip that she took up the Peace River when she was the provincial archivist of Alberta and when she was also working on the, the biography of Alberta Commission, the Open Ministry. In other words, she was doing her work as an, as an archivist, starting to collect material from the old timers, but she was also collecting material from people of the uh, Northern Alberta, including from Catholic clerics, priests, and, and, and nuns for her biography of Alberta Home. That work uh, lay uh, unrecognized in the Edmonton So something like that has come out, reflects again this increasing sort of uh, uh, interest in use or final sort of interest in use. Similarly, from the Irish perspective, uh, this book, Simon Jolivet's book, Le Verde de Bleu, dealing with Irish identity in Quebec in the early years of the 20th century, as a whole, it just book came out about six months ago, has a, probably a whole series of 10 to 15 references to use or self determination. Yeah, it's kind of neat in, the, in her work when she was dealing with self learning her work in Quebec. Uh, again, a collection of stuff that's starting to come out. And this book, which should have been published for this stage, based on Robert McGuffin's PhD uh, thesis done in, uh, in Maine, which was due out at the University of Toronto Press uh, more or less a year ago for this stage. For some reason, I'm not too sure if I can guess, but it's been delayed for next year. But again, as a whole series, of reference to use. Uh, so what I'm suggesting in my, in my own way is that uh, uh, there is finally a fair amount of work going on. Uh, the, the journal, the last journey, if you like, is now reclaiming Catholic Hughes as a notable, talented member of the Irish diaspora, as a participant in the struggle for Irish political as part of the story of Canadian life <coughs> and, public, and a contribution to public life and discourse, and most importantly, the one of reclaiming gay views of Canada, <coughs> not just for the Irish and the Pacific Islands, but for everyone in the European and the Canadian islands.
interested because obviously there are lots of exceptions to these things. Well, there's almost like, it's kind of funny because when you look at this trip to the, uh, to the World Fair, at which the Gay Women's Press Club was established, while the, these women were in, um, uh, were in Chicago, so what part of the trip, they visited this um, colony that was run by Jane Addams. And Jane Addams is a big, big figure in progressive politics and, uh, and social reform in the United States in the latter part of the 19th century and the 20th century. Um, uh, in that sense, you know, if you kind of there's the trip there by a lot of these women, as we as part of the way that they start in the direction of uh, social reform, they're all looking at one of their hero figures. But of course, Hughes doesn't take that route. But it's one of the ironies that Jane Adams did with social reform, including uh, women's suffrage. But for later on, in 1917, 19. You know what is an issue for progressives such as Jane Adams? Because of Irish independence. So you find almost like indirectly Catherine Hughes and Jane Adams, 10 or so years later, are basically on the same side because they sort of share this kind of common view about the cause of Irish independence. So again, if people sort of move in different directions, it doesn't necessarily mean that for various reasons it's clear that in the Irish context, there are major figures such as Hannah Sheedy Skeppington, who's a sort of, again, a celebrated figure in the context of the Irish uh, uh, reform movement, who's one of the big figures in things that push for, for votes for Ireland, for Irish women, before the, the, before the First World War in 1916. Um, what happens with someone like Hannah Sheedy Skeppington, who's kind of an educated Catholic woman who's into sort of social reform and the suffrage movement. Her husband gets killed in the Ice Easter Rising, executed by a British officer. She subsequently basically puts aside her interest in social reform and sort of says the cause that we have to focus on is Irish independence. And once we get that, social reform will come. Of course, it wasn't always possible that that's going to happen. So in other words, what I'm suggesting, and, and it's a bit of a long-winded response to, you, to your answer, not all Catholic women would have followed the route that Catholic Hughes did. But there seems to be enough of them who attitude that they are going to direct their energy into the church movement rather than into social reform. Is it something that derives from the nature of Catholicism, from sort of a, a, a hierarchy and things like that there? Possibly. The people here may well be able to make that better than I can. Sort of choices again, the directest idea of starting on journeys and going different directions, but sometimes it's like actually looking back later on. Later on in her career, Catherine Hughes, when she's an Irish activist in the United States, she sort of, she's drafting plans for, for their publicity and propaganda campaign. She's talking about they ought to be working with women uh, as suffragists, suffragist actors. Uh, but what he sort of says is, uh, is that, that she now has become sort of somebody who believes in the, uh, in the, suffrage, the suffragist movement, or is it a case that she just sort of sees this as something that she can piggyback on as regards. You, know, you never know what's driving things at times. She doesn't really explain it. Again, these gaps that are right there. Yet I'm, I'm not sure that actually explains what, 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 what uh, your actual question. It's the nature of doing Catholicism in some ways, but also uh, probably in the context of times. In your Yes, right, yeah. So I was wondering, uh, Catherine graduated from Prince of Wales in 1892. 
I'm going to stand up with a correction here, but I think it was Lucy Bob Montgomery, I graduated in 1893. Uh, that, that. So, inevitably, as uh, one would expect in a fairly small college, they knew each other, but not the, 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 the same to sort of go different routes. I've no sort of, I've never come across Catherine Hughes making any, any reference to uh, Catherine Hughes. And anything I've seen on Lucy Maud Montgomery, there's no, record, no mention of Catherine Hughes. But one of the things which you kind of point students on the way, which I sort of get a bit interested in the way in which, um, in which, which people get forgotten. People fall uh, between cracks. In other words, and again, what I'm pointing here in some ways is say they, here we have in the context of Catherine Hughes, an island woman who, whatever you think about her stand on various issues, was an amazingly sort of talented and energetic figure. But how is it that somebody falls between the cracks in the context of everybody on Prince Edward Island knows about Lucy Paul and Montgomery? Who knows about Catherine Kind of interesting kind of read. And again, I would take that beyond, and I'm not sort of throwing a collective guilt thing on you people, <laughs> but it fascinates me because, for example, this, this character uh, based in that kind of years working on. There have been books published about the, about the Irish in Liverpool. This guy spent 24 years in fighting in Liverpool. It's his formative influence. Uh, and he's never mentioned there for that matter. It's amazing in the way of the way in which, for all sorts of complex reasons, some people fall between the cracks. And so I presume that uh, Catherine Hughes knew Lucy Martin Montgomery, but uh, they shared a space certain time, but neither seems to have impinged on the other's consciousness sufficiently to leave any trace of it. Hughes, after she graduates from Prince of Wales in 1892, I lose track of her for a while, again, from the gaps in the next kind of, but she's publishing short stories, Prince Edward Prince, uh, Island Magazine. She publishes a number of short stories in that. Similarly, uh, the next trace I have for her is when she's working with the natives in, uh, in Ontario and uh, Quebec. So there is a gap in my, in my sort of knowledge of what exactly she's been involved in and to what extent she, she, she met up with other emerging writers in Prince Edward Island. I, I, I just don't know. But certainly, and stuff that I've come across from the correspondence of uh, Elizabeth Montgomery, I've never come across any reference to Catholic Hughes. Any other question? If not, it just remains once more to thank Brother Lafayette for coming. <laughs>
Thank you for coming. Have something to eat. Stay in talk.